Good morning and thank you for joining me on the Path to Liberty. It's Monday, March 30th, 2020. And on this episode, we're talking about the central bank, the Federal Reserve, national debt, paper money, and more. Advice, warnings, and wisdom from Thomas Jefferson in the face of another $6 trillion. First of all, my name is Michael Bolden. We broadcast live every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time from here in my home office and studio in downtown Los Angeles for the 10th Amendment Center. We've got a bunch of platforms. We're on our live streaming video platforms, our YouTube, Periscope, DLive, Twitch, and Facebook. We have archived video versions on Brighteon.com, BitTube, BitChute, and Library. Plus our audio-only podcast editions. You can find uh, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, and elsewhere. Find all of our archives, all of the show notes, all the links that I, well, most of the links that I reference in each episode. Plus all the platforms you can follow us on. And of course, our membership program, which starts out as little as two bucks a month. And I know this is a difficult time for everybody. I'm so grateful for those of you who are members and those of you who are considering, but don't feel pressure to do that. I understand that it's tight for everybody, but if you're able to, it's 10th Amendment Center.com slash path to liberty. That's where you can find the homepage for this program, plus all that other stuff, our membership program, etc. So let's get to this. I want to take a look over the live chat. I know Restream, the app that we use, has been having some trouble. They're under attack, so I'm not sure if I can be able to pull up all the chat. I'll do my best. I want to say hello to everyone I can see over on YouTube. Essential Freedom, Bob Brewer, Ready to Rumble, Yo Mama, uh, Tyler B, Patricia Dance, Too Tall 509, and everyone else. I am not getting the chats in from Facebook right now, but let me see if I can make that actually work. Bear with me a moment. Okay, there we go. And I'll check back on that a little bit later. But first of all, uh, you know, I was looking into this. And as we're facing bailouts and stimulus checks and all this, the federal government was already going crazy, mind you. Over the past few years, all along since 1913, we know since 2008, in order to get out of the Great Recession, they've been inflating an even bigger, bigger bubble than ever. But with more money printing and trillions and trillions and trillions being piled up on top of $23 trillion national debt, I don't think this is going to be pretty. So as I was digging through this, I'm like, man, I'm going to get some wisdom from the founders on this. And almost every single, you know, there's great quotes from James Madison and Richard Henry Lee and even one from Alexander Hamilton on paper money. Surprise, surprise, because he was the big government guy of the time. So in comparison today, even he was way better. But as I was going through this, I just kept finding, and I should have known, like all the letters and quotes that I've compiled over the years, Jefferson after Jefferson after Jefferson. So rather than me rambling through and trying to explain what he means, I want to go through some of my top quotes from Thomas Jefferson on paper money, spending and the debt, and then, of course, the central bank. And I will link to all of these letters in the show notes over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty so you can pull them up. You can read it in full. You can uh, reference, etc. when people tell you, oh, you're lying. Jefferson never said that. So let's go to it. I think the most important one to start out with is this letter to Edward Carrington from May 27th, 1788. Let me pull it up on the screen here. Jefferson says, Paper is poverty. It is only the ghost of money and not money itself. And of course, we are being hammered with more and more paper money by the day. As the Fed prints more money, of course, the prices of things go up. The, the inflation really isn't a price inflation. It is an inflation in the monetary supply. Next up on paper money, Jefferson put it this way in a letter to John Wales Epps on November 6th, 1813. He says, the trifling, this is a this is a paraphrase, but you can read, again, I will link to that in the show notes. The trifling economy of paper is liable to be abused, has been, is, and forever will be abused in every country which it is permitted. Like, we were warned about this. If you allow the government to create fiat money, it is always going to be abused. It always has been. It always was in every single country where they allowed it. And of course, now we're talking about trillions by the week that they're just throwing out there like crazy. Let me see if I can pull up this full letter here as well. This one is to Thomas Cooper the following year, just a, actually two months later. From that 
uh, letter to Epps to January 16th, 1814. He put it this way. Everything predicted by the enemies of banks in the beginning is now coming to pass. Mind you, this is 1814. He said, we are to be ruined now by the deluge of bank paper as we were formerly by the old continental paper. I can't say Jefferson, again, didn't warn us, wasn't wise, couldn't see what was going on and the problems of what we're talking about. So those are three great, great quotes, I think, that Jefferson had on paper money. Of course, I know there are many more. If you've got some favorites outside of these, I'd love to see those in the comments, whether they are live or or in the archive, or feel free to email email me, team at 10thamendmentcenter.com, if you want me to cover something else that Jefferson said, or maybe another idea for a show in the future. So let's move on to just spending and debt. First of all, we know that Jefferson really wasn't a fan of taking the country into a big, deep debt like people like big government spenders like Hamilton and others. And as he was uh, earlier on, before he even became president, here's a letter to Elbridge Jerry on January 26, 1799. He put it this way. I am for a government rigorously frugal and simple. Couldn't be further from that today. Rigorously frugal and simple, Jefferson writes, applying all the possible savings of the public revenue to the discharge of the national debt. The reason that Jefferson and even Washington warned about warned against having a national debt is in times of emergency, you need to be able to crank up whatever you're doing and spend a ton. They actually recognized that government was going to do this. But if at times of peace or supposed prosperity, you really needed to get that debt as close to zero as possible, pay it down. So in crazy times, you don't destroy the economy for generations to come. Jefferson goes on. Again, this is a letter to Elbridge Jerry in 1799. He says, I am for a um, discharge of the national debt and not for a multiplication of officers and salaries merely to make partisans and for increasing by every de device the public debt on the principle of its being a public blessing. He saw it as a public curse. And here he is to Thomas Cooper on November 29th, 1802. If we can prevent the government from wasting the labors of the people under the pretense of taking care of them, they must be happy. Again, we're living in a society that's totally opposite. They waste the labors of the people over and over and over, and then they pretend to take care of the people. So we're going to run into a lot of problems as this expands even further than it is today. And then in his second inaugural address, mind you, he so these were his promises as he was getting in to be, becoming president. Everyone kind of knew his mentality on this. He wanted to not waste the labors, not wanted to. He didn't want the government to pretend to take care of people. And so by the end of his first term, what did he do? Here's his second inaugural address. This was March 4th, 1805. He talks about, first of all, he says, you know, at home, he's talking about all the things that he's done. And he says, at home, fellow citizens, you best know whether we have done well or ill. And how does how do you describe that? He says, the suppression of unnecessary offices, of useless establishments and expenses enabled us to discontinue our internal taxes. So when he came into office, there were a lot of expenses. He actually even cut down on military spending. And he did all of this, cut down on unnecessary offices, bureaucrats. You never hear anyone really talking about that today. And that allowed him to actually discontinue internal taxes. When was the last time that happened? Probably 1805 is probably the last time that happened. And then here in a letter to John Taylor, on May 28th, 1816, he says, The principle of spending money to be paid by, by posterity under the name of funding is but swindling futurity on a large scale. And this back and forth with him and John Taylor, I've covered Taylor's commentary on this probably in an episode just late last week. Basically, this idea that you can tax a future generation to make it easier for the current generation is a total scam. That's how Taylor basically put it. And Jefferson is saying, if you're even if you're kicking it down the road, even if you don't feel the effects of it immediately, we know when we're talking trillions of dollars eventually, and it's not going to take too long for the average person to feel the impact of that uh, price rise caused by the inflation in money supply. 
at best, you are ripping off future generations. And they don't deserve this. In my hopes, I hope they actually just repudiate the entire debt. And here he is in a letter just later that summer, July 12th, 1816, to Samuel Kercheval. I want to read this one in full because I think it says quite a bit. He says, I am not among those who fear the people. They and not the rich are our dependents for continued freedom. And to preserve their independence, we must not let our rulers load us with perpetual debt. So in order, in order for people to be free and independent, you can't let the people running the country add on massive perpetual debt. And that's exactly where we are today. So that means we will not have freedom. Even if you think we have it now, uh, it certainly is going to be less and less as time goes because of this crazy amount of debt. He goes on, he says, we must make our election between economy and liberty or profusion and servitude. If we run into such debts as that we must be taxed in our meat and in our drink, in our necessaries and our comforts, in our labors and our amusements, for our callings and our creeds, as the people of England are, our people like them must come to labor 16 hours in the 24. Give the earnings of 15 of these to the government for their debts and daily expenses. And the 16th being in a, insufficient to afford us bread, we must live as they do now on oatmeal and potatoes, have no time to think, no means of calling the mismanagers to account. That's how the Federal Reserve brings the population to their knees. Because if you're stretched so thin that you have to spend every waking moment just trying to get by because there's so much money supply out there that's causing the prices of things to go up, destroying the economy, then you have less time and energy and capability to actually call out the people who are screwing it up. And that's part of the problem with all this spending. So those are some, what is that, one, two, three, four, five on spending and debt. There are actually many others. Again, if you've got ideas that you uh, want to share, please post those in the comments or send me an email. And then finally, let's cover a few on the central bank because the Federal Reserve is the engine that funds all this garbage. If you think of a, a federal program that you don't like, certainly you've got the agents that do the enforcement. In most situations, a significant portion of that is done on a state or a local level. But also, we want to keep track of who's actually creating an environment where they're paying for this stuff. Because if they were just relying on taxation, and taxation is theft, if they were just coming into your pocket, you create a scenario where there's going to be more resistance or potential for more resistance on this. Instead, we're talking about just printing money, just handing it out, just adding a bunch of zeros to a bunch of ledgers. And that's not going to lead to good results either. So here's Thomas Jefferson, his opinion on the constitutionality of a national bank. That would be our Federal Reserve today in 1791. This is how Jefferson put it, just pretty straightforward. Let me pull this up so you guys can see it. He says, the incorporation of a bank has not been delegated to the United States by the Constitution, just period. I mean, we can read through Article 1, Section 8 and through the rest of the document, and Jefferson's opinion is that there's nowhere to be found. You can look through it all you want, flip the words upside down, and the only way that you can actually say the federal government has the power to incorporate a bank is to pretty much make it up. And that's my view on it. I agree with Thomas Jefferson and reject the Hamiltonian position on a national bank. So he was taking that position all the way back in 1791. There should be no national bank. The Constitution never authorized it in the first place. So 1913, the creation of the Federal Reserve, the Federal Reserve shouldn't exist. Now, certainly we know that government isn't just going to follow the rules on paper. They're just not going to dissolve the, the Federal Reserve because we're telling them, hey, look, Jefferson said. Uh, but it is important for the rest of us to know so we can draw our own line in the sand. And then going further... On November 6th, 1813, here he is to Thomas Law. He says, the idea of creating a national bank, I do not concur in. It's basically the same view, but I wanted to show how consistent he was. Unlike so many current politicians who take one position on the Fed today, and then when it benefits them later on, they change their tune. They oppose the Fed for printing too much or creating too low of an interest rate when one team is in the office, in power. And then when they get in power, they're saying, oh, the Fed needs to go to negative interest rates. The insanity of the flip-flopping is what creates an even more dangerous situation because a lot of the mindless sheep who just follow whatever their leaders tell them, all of a sudden they're changing their tunes. They have no principles. 
Jefferson, on the other hand, was very consistent on this. 1791, 1813, and then here he is again in that letter to, uh, to John Taylor on May 28th, 1816. And he put it this way. This may be the most famous one that I see post, people post the most often. He says, and I sincerely believe with you that banking establishments are more dangerous than standing armies and that the principle of spending money to be paid by posterity under the name of funding is but swindling futurity on a large scale. Let me see if I can pull up any of the live chat here and see what's going on here. <clears throat> Eric Ellie says, that's very important too. It wouldn't be so bad for the government to use its central power in times of extreme need. The real issue is that the level of government has already gone so far. And I think many of the founders actually took that position. Not that, that now Jefferson, of course, said to take a single step beyond the Constitution was to take a boundless field of power. It's not that the founders were just saying, you know, every time there's an emergency, just go violate the Constitution. But certainly, if they're going to ramp up spending for whatever it may be, and they often talked about it in regards to war powers, for example, they knew that in times of war, uh, centralization of power, the executive would grab more power, and there would be a lot more spending. But in order to actually be strong, in order to be strong, you have to have the credit to be able to actually deal with those situations for short terms. And then when it's over, pay it down. Don't continue inflating a bubble. Sooner or later, the thing's gonna come crashing down and it's, well, it's gonna be painful. Archangel for Truth says we need to declare our independence from this government. Uh, hi to Florida Tenther over on Facebook. Caveat Emperor, Emptor says Shane Lackey. Brilliant Radiance is lurking, and Domo says burning the dollar. Certainly, now I've seen some charts. I was watching some YouTubes this morning. There was a guy who posted a chart talking about the purchasing power of the dollar going, I, I don't know. I think the number from 1913, once the Federal Reserve came in till now, it's dropped somewhere like over 94, 95%. I've seen numbers as high as 97%. So what you could purchase with that dollar 100 plus years ago was far more. It just takes more money because they keep putting more money in circulation. This is artificial uh, increase or artificial increases in pay and artificial increases in money that you have on hand, artificial increases in credit by manipulating the interest rates to be lower than what the market would have them and on and on. Shane Lackey says, Fed notes aren't worth a continental. That's a good line as well. And Florida Tenther says, Washington to Jabez Brown. I'm not familiar with this one. Paper money has had the effect in your state that it ever will have to ruin commerce, oppress the honest, and open a door to every species of fraud and injustice. And this stuff is all so incredibly important for us to understand because what happens? So many people are like, oh, of course. Well, if there's a problem, just turn on that printing press. Just ramp up more money. It's the world's reserve currency, and this can never go wrong. But Jefferson put it this way, and I forget when he actually wrote this one. I think it was 1816. Charles Yancey, I believe it was. He put it this way. If a nation expects to be ignorant and free, it expects what never was and never will be. Again, whether it comes to spending, debt, paper money, the central bank, Jefferson was so very consistent over a period of decades. He warned us against all of these things, warned us against having paper money instead of sound money, warned us against having a central bank, warned us against running up massive debts in times of peace, warned us against having elective wars because then you create the scenario where it keeps going. As Madison put it, of course, he thought not that banking establishments were more dangerous, but he thought that war was the worst because war led to armies and debts and taxes. And armies and debts and taxes are the known instruments, Madison put it, for putting the many under the domination of the few. Well, I hope you guys found this really interesting. I hope you learned something. I think seeing it all together like this really helped me kind of clarify Jefferson's position on this. As I mentioned earlier, there are many other founders that took this kind of position as well. Richard Henry Lee, James Madison, and many others. Probably George Mason is a pretty good one as well. But if you enjoy the show and you support what we're doing, make sure to smash that like button. Continue leaving comments, whether it's live or in the archive. Subscribe, get bell notifications, reviews on iTunes or whatever podcast platform you may be listening on. All of these free actions, they cost nothing. They take just moments of your time. All of these free actions trigger the algorithm of the platform you may be watching or listening on. They're all very easily triggered. 
and it tells those platforms to show the program to more people. So I'm very grateful for that. I'm also very grateful for a number of people that I see out here who are members of the 10th Amendment Center without the financial backing to do this we we wouldn't exist so we definitely need some financial support and if you support liberty you consume our content regularly you support the constitution we do everything we can to make as much content available for free we've got over 10,000 articles blogs videos uh, podcasts and the like on our website, tenthamendmentcenter.com, over the years. And we're going to continue doing this, but it would mean the world to me if you'd consider joining us as a member. It starts as little as two bucks a month over at tenthamendmentcenter.com slash members. I hope you had a good weekend considering the circumstances. I hope you are safe, happy, healthy, and thinking about how we're going to stand for freedom as we fight the police state moving forward. Thank you for spending some time with me today, and I'll see you next time here on the Path to Liberty.